Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, methodological issues related to uh, the analysis of sleep EEG, although I'd like to think that uh, at least some of the things I'll mention are also relevant to non-sleep EEG. And just as a side note, just so you know, um, I'll be looking at a different screen to follow my own presentation uh, than the one that has my camera. So um, just so you understand why, why it looks like I'm not uh, addressing you at all. So even though I do a lot of signal processing, I don't have a formal signal processing background myself. So I thought it would be worthwhile to quickly mention uh, how I uh, became involved in signal processing and uh, what my uh, trajectory there was. Uh, so during my bachelor's and master's, I maybe had some uh, conceptual uh, exposure to signal processing like Fourier analysis, but not much beyond that. There was a lot of statistics, but actual signal processing, not so much. Then as I went on to do my PhD, working on uh, sleep oscillations and memory, I got my first hands-on uh, exposure to signal processing and coding, in my case, MATLAB. Um, but at this stage, it was very much a means to an end. So it was the conceptual questions that I found interesting, uh, not the methods. These were just hoops you had to jump through to, to answer your question. But then as I continued my work, uh, doing more work on sleep, wake oscillations, memory, some other things, um, I started to realize that different methods often uh, give you different results. And this kind of posed a problem. How can the answer to your conceptual question depend on the method you're using? And then on top of that, um, I discover coding errors all the time to this day. And unfortunately, that implies that I also don't discover many of them. So taking that together, how and when can I trust my own and also others' findings if, all, if the answer to your question depends so much on the signal processing implementations? So now I more feel that methods are absolutely critical to answer conceptual questions, and also that you need to have at least a decent amount of understanding of the methods you're using uh, to understand uh, what conclusions you can actually draw uh, from what you've done. So I'm not going to tell you in this talk how we record sleep EEG. Um, there's other sources for that. I'll just very briefly highlight um, some of the issues that we're dealing with. So first of all, for overnight recordings, of course, we have many, many hours of, uh, of data. And in contemporary sleep EEG, we often have dozens or even hundreds of channels. So here on the left, I'm showing you just 100 channels. Uh, of the 250, uh, 256 that we record routine, routinely in the lab I, I work in today. And then at the same time, all those different channels can be decomposed into different frequency bands. You can detect different waveforms like sleep spindles or slow oscillations, other things. And then on top of that, we have countless metrics of activity and coordination between channels, between frequency bands. And just as a very brief uh, example, uh, here I'm showing you two simulated uh, traces of a slow oscillation with a spindle on top for two different channels. And then we can uh, filter those signals in these, uh, in these slow oscillation bands and look at, at their phases and see how they relate. In this case, they don't relate very uh, well, but that would be an uh, example of phase synchrony. We can also filter both in the slow oscillation band and in the spindle band. I apologize for my weird triangular spindles here, but I didn't have the time or uh, interest to, to really make these look physiological. But then we can look at things like cross-frequency coupling between the slow oscillation and the spindle. And of course, we can also relate the spindle in one channel to slow oscillations on a different channel. And then taking into account all these different channels and the different frequency bands, um, there's just so much you can do and things become, uh, if you want to, really complex really quickly. So last year, when I was working in the lab of Jurgen Fell, we published this paper uh, analyzing human sleep EEG. And essentially it's a um, overview of 
things I picked up over the years that I wish I'd known when starting out and that may be of use to others. And so mostly based on my experience doing human scalp and some intracranial sleep EEG. Um, but as I mentioned, I think many of the points in there are also relevant to animal or wake or non EE or non EEG uh, other physiological signals. And in the paper, uh, we discuss a number of topics on methodological issues related to spectral analysis, montage and reference scheme, extracting phase and amplitude information, surrogate testing, and false positives. And we also supply MATLAB code to illustrate these issues and also to reproduce uh, the figures from the paper. So in this talk, I'll be discussing the topics from the paper, um, not in as much detail as I would like because of time constraints, but then I'll add some additional thoughts that are in line with this whole um, notion of, of sharing things that I uh, hope are helpful to others. And I'll uh, end with some recommendations. So to dive in right away, uh, the first topic from the paper we discussed is spectral analysis. So roughly speaking, the power spectrum uh, gives you, uh, tells you about the contribution of each frequency component to a time domain signal. So here on the left, I'm uh, showing you 28 different individuals' power spectra during light and two sleep in red and during deep and three sleep in blue with frequency on the X axis and normalized power on the Y axis. And we'll get to normalization in a bit. But what you can immediately um, see is that almost every individual shows a pretty prominent peak around 14 Hertz, uh, consistent with fast sleep spindles. And then a decent proportion of individuals also show a peak at uh, the slow spindle frequency around 10 Hertz. So these type of plots give you a very broad overview of signal properties. So the rhythmic components that are present but they also tell you about variability uh, between stages and individuals in this case, but it could also be between groups. Uh, another thing that why these um, plots could be really useful is they give you, give you an idea of the quality of your signal. Uh, this is maybe a poor example because the data we used was actually pretty clean, uh, but sometimes you see a really spiky peak somewhere that looks different from these more smoother peaks. And that could be an indication that um, there's something wrong with your data. It contains artifacts. Now, another big reason why I like lo looking at these plots is uh, because it places band-specific or waveform-specific analyses in context. So imagine, for example, that for whatever reason you're interested in theta power and you found a difference between groups in theta power. Now, it's entirely possible that that theta effect isn't specific to theta, but rather it's indicative of a broadband um, difference between your groups across frequency bands. And you would never realize this if you would only looked at, uh, at theta. So that's another reason why I, I like always looking at the, um, the power spectrum. So how do we calculate um, the power spectrum? Very roughly speaking, this is simplified maybe beyond what, what's really um, didactically um, appropriate, but we can say that the time domain signal can be expressed as a sum of signs, each with specific amplitude and phase coefficients. So here I'm showing you 20 seconds of N2 sleep, and below I'm showing the full um, spectrum uh, expressed in three different ways, and we'll get to that in a second. But one thing you can already notice is that these plots, uh, these traces look really noisy. And the reason for that is that the frequency resolution of your power spectrum is essentially dictated by the num number of samples in your time uh, domain signal. So the longer the signal you have, um, the higher frequency resolution you get. Now, there's a lot of um, important things to mention about the Fourier spectrum. I'm not going to um, explain it in, in detail, but some of the things that are important to be aware of is, first of all, the distinction between the continuous and uh, the discrete Fourier spectrum. But in the case of sample data, like we have for EEG or pretty much every other physiological signal, uh, we only have to worry about the discrete version. 
Then there's a distinction between a two-sided and a one-sided spectrum, where the two-sided spectrum contains negative frequencies that we typically want to get rid of. Um, the Fourier spectrum itself is complex valued, but from the, those complex values, we can extract both an amplitude and a phase spectrum. And probably the most important point from this slide is that from this amplitude spectrum, we can also calculate the power spectrum and power spectral density. And these, these different terms have a pretty straightforward relation to one another. Um, but it's important to realize that they're often used in a rather loose sense. And sometimes that doesn't matter. In other uh, cases, it's really a source of uh, a lot of confusion. So it's um, important to be aware of the distinctions. Now, I just mentioned the regular um, spectrum looks way too noisy for most purposes. So what we typically do is we estimate power by taking a sliding window that we move across the signal. And then for each window, we essentially calculate the power spectrum and then we average them. And there's lots of uh, different approaches for doing that. Uh, there's the Welch, the Bartlett, multi-taper, wavelet approaches. Uh, I've mostly used Welch and that's also what I'm use, uh, showing here on the right side. And what you can immediately appreciate that even for the short bit of data, 20 seconds, uh, taking this Welch approach already um, cleans up the data in, uh, in many ways. So now we can discern pretty clear, uh, pretty clear uh, fast spindle peaks. This looks like a slow spindle peak. And here's a slow oscillation peak. Uh, so also important to mention that already here, we have lots of parameter choices to choose from window length, taper shape, overlap, other things um, that can all affect um, the exact shape of your power spectrum and the type of features you can uh, discern. So what are some of the things we can say about um, the power spectrum computed, for example, using Welch's method? So the first thing to um, note is that there are uh, the difference in power is orders of shows orders of magnitude difference across frequencies. So that's shown most clearly here, uh, where the y-axis is just a linear axis, and you see that all the power is contained in the lower frequency range. And these orders of magnitude difference are um, best described by a so-called one over F distribution or power law scaling. And another way of showing that is if you make your Y axis logarithmic, you have a roughly linear drop off uh, with frequencies. And then looking at a plot like this, we typically take a positive deviation from that background one over, one over F activity as a, a, a signal that there might be some periodic activity going on in your time domain signal. Now, it's also important to mention that power is always positive, um, even if there's no uh, oscillatory or rhythmic behavior in, in the time domain signal. And I mentioned that because you sometimes um, see people mention uh, beta or gamma oscillations which might be there, but based on a power spectrum like this, where there's essentially a flat line in the, uh, in the beta range, uh, those, those, that's better described as beta power rather than beta oscillations. Now, another thing to mention is that instead of taking, uh, instead of making the y-axis logarithmic, we can also take the logarithm of the power itself but then it's important to realize that whenever your raw power was below one, uh, the logarithm will take that in, will turn that into a negative number. Um, and that's important to realize because, um, well, if you're not aware of that, you might not understand what's happening to your, to your values. So the raw power or PSD has a relatively simple relation to the signal amplitude of your time domain signal in the sense that larger amplitudes in the time domain um, translate into greater power. And here I'm showing you an example of two different channels uh, during uh, two different sleep stages, N2 and N3. The exact which line is which doesn't matter too much right now, uh, but you can see that, for example, here, there's differences in slow oscillation power between those conditions. 
And here there's a clear peak at the slow spindle range uh, for one particular channel during N N3 sleep. So this gives you a very straightforward relation with how big those uh, signals look in the time domain signal. Now at the same time, um, power is affected by things like impedance, skull thickness, and these are things that we might want to um, correct for. So a common way of doing this is by uh, computing a normalized or relative power. And there's different ways of doing that. Uh, most often it's done relative to total power, so power across all your frequency bands. You could also use an arbitrary frequency range. And as I mentioned, we do this to account for individual or channel differences. But it's important to uh, realize that um, normalizing introduces dependencies uh, both between frequencies and um, it introduces dependencies between frequencies and it can also affect your topography. And there's different reasons for that, but probably uh, the main one uh, has to do with this one over F um, uh, drop off because most of the power of the total power is contained in the slow frequency ranges. If you normalize relative to total power, what you're doing, you can see that on the right here, is you're essentially equalizing power in the slowest frequency bands. So now all these lines are right on top of each other. Another way of looking at it is that you're um, making the offsets uh, similar. But because of that, you now have uh, big differences in beta power between these conditions that you didn't have previously. And another uh, thing to notice from this particular example is that whereas we previously had uh, clearly um, highest slow spindle power in this particular condition, the solid blue line, this solid blue line is now actually somewhat below this uh, dashed green line. So if you were to just look at uh, the raw values that you get, you might um, have you might come to the conclusion that those two conditions show a similar slow spindle activity. And uh, depending on how you look at this, that's probably, uh, that may not be the conclusion you want to um, reach. Um, some other things about um, power spectrum, um, whenever we compute band specific power, for example, slow wave activity or theta activity, there's many options to choose from. Um, first, we have to decide whether we use power or PSD, uh, then whether we use the raw values, the log transformed values or normalized values. And then for the normalized values themselves, those can be based on the raw spectrum or an already log transformed uh, spectrum. And then finally, when we actually want to compute the power across the band, do we sum, do we average, do we multiply by bin width? Uh, the frequency bin width uh, to um, as a way to integrate power across the frequency range. And some of these methods are probably more correct than others. At the same time, um, I think it's more important that you actually um, specify what you did uh, rather than adhering to um, a particular recipe. Another issue uh, or another thing that we can do is instead of um, normalizing, we can try to remove the one over F component. And there's different approaches. Uh, I'll show you an example of slope fitting. So this inset here uh, shows the raw power, or in this case, a log transform power, as you would typically see it in two brain structures. But what you can do is you can try to estimate the slope and, and the offset and try to, um, to fit it to these, um, to these spectra and then subtract that slope. And then you're left with uh, these spectra here. And what you can see is that these peaks here around 60, 70 Hertz, which in this case uh, we think um, are indicative of uh, ripple activity, this is intracranial data those peaks aren't clearly uh, visible at all in, in the raw spectrum. So this type of approach can really help to enhance subtle peaks or shoulders in your, in your power spectrum. Now, at the same time, this also introduces new problems because um, the fitting procedure will result in different slopes for different channels. 
And what do we do if the slopes themselves differ systematically between channels or between groups? Um, and there's no easy solutions for that as of yet. So to summarize, uh, spectral analysis offers a really useful summary of the data, but there's a great many spectral options out there with potentially large effects on results. And unfortunately, there's usually not a single best option. Um, my last point here, details often not reported. That goes from many things, uh, also for some of the other methodological issues I'll talk about, but I feel that particularly for spectral analysis, it seems that it's um, maybe considered such a uh, relatively simple analysis that um, those details don't need to be reported. And I'll say that that's not the case if you, if you ask me. All right, so on to EEG montages and references. So whenever we measure the electrical potential, like we do with EEG, uh, we measure the potential at a site A relative to a baseline or a reference. And so there's many ways of doing, uh, of doing that for EEG. Um, there's different ways of categorizing it. I'm choosing it to categorize it in this way. Uh, the first category is actually not quite a reference category, but they're, but I'm including them uh, nonetheless. So there's this category of so-called reference-free methods. Uh, the surface Laplacian is, is a good example, which is technically based on uh, the second spatial derivative. It doesn't matter, but it, it's a way of highlighting local activity underlying each electrode. Now, coming to a true reference uh, scheme, um, we can, um, go for, excuse me. Yeah, so there's a category of a variable reference. Um, and here the idea is that you use different references for different electrodes. The most extreme one is maybe the bipolar um, reference. And here you, ref um, you relate every electrode to the immediately adjacent one. And that's also a way to highlight local activity. Uh, another big one is the contralateral mastoid, which is uh, primarily used for sleep scoring, where you reference half of the scalp to the mastoid on the other side and vice versa. And the final category is the common reference, which as its name implies means you have a single baseline for all your channels. Uh, this could be a single site like CZ or uh, the forehead. Um, but the two uh, ones I'll be discussing are the link mastoids and the common average. So with link mastoids, the basic idea is that we want to place our reference over an area that's relatively silent. And um, it's kind of um, impossible to find a truly silent uh, location uh, over the scalp. But as far as looking for a silent place goes, I, I think mastoids are probably your best bet. Um, so here I'm showing you on the right four midline channels from the EEG from uh, the front to back. And I'm placing vertical lines over the trough of the slow oscillation and another one over the trough and the next one over the peak. Now, if you look at these signals, uh, either those uh, slow oscillations or just the rest of the signal, um, they show a very similar appearance across channels, including the polarity. Um, but it's important to realize that this is at least partly and probably even largely due to volume conduction, uh, whereby uh, a single neural source, um, the electromagnetic field from a neural source propagates almost instantaneously across uh, the brain. And so you pick it up everywhere. Now, if we compare this to uh, the common average reference, um, that's what these signals look like. Um, quick side note, um, the assumption between the common average is that at every sample, all potentials should sum to zero. The idea being that um, according to physics, there shouldn't be any net surplus or deficit in potential. Um, so if we now compare these common average signals to the link mastoid signals, we can still see for this first slow oscillation um, that the first two channels uh, show a trough here, but then the third one doesn't show much. And, and the fourth one, we suddenly have a peak. And the same goes for these other um, uh, slow oscillations here. 
So it's very common to get a polarity reversal. And for lack of a better term, you could call this a waterbed effect that with respect to the ling mastoids reference, you're now pushing effects um, also to distant areas. And while this is um, reasonably well uh, appreciated in general, um, it also has some repercussions for more advanced uh, metrics that we might be interested in when we um, look at sleep EEG. So here I am showing you as an example, phase synchrony using the phase blocking value between the C channel and the rest of the scalp. So this top left uh, plot here shows connectivity between this frontal uh, blue um, site and the rest of the scalp with yellow indicating stronger connectivity and black uh, um, lower connectivity. So what you can see immediately here, this is the ling mastoids reference. Connectivity is strongest with nearby channels and um, not so much with um, distant channels. And we can also look at the actual phase difference between that seed electrode and the rest of the scalp. And that then gives us a really uniform map of zero phase difference. And so this is very consistent with that, um, with the similarity of the channels in the, in the time domain. Now, if we look at the common average instead, we also see strong connectivity with nearby channels, but then there's this intermediate region of low connectivity. And then finally, high connectivity again with uh, distant areas. And if we now look at the phase difference map, um, there's essentially a bipolar distribution uh, with the, the anterior half of the scalp showing zero phase difference, similar to the ling mastoids, but the posterior half now shows this anti-phase relation or 100, 100, 180 degrees difference. Um, and so this is consistent with that polarity reversal um, that we saw in the time domain signals. Now, I, I won't go into it, but this isn't restricted to slow oscillations. You can find it in other frequency bands as well. Um, and it's also not restricted to this particular uh, metric of, um, of connectivity, uh, the phase locking value. You can see it with other measures of functional connectivity as well. Um, just as another example, uh, cross-frequency coupling between slow oscillations and spindles is also affected by the reference. So here, uh, the top two plots again show the ling mastoids uh, reference and what I'm plotting here is the phase of the slow oscillation at which uh, spindles are preferentially expressed. And for slow spindles, we see that it's that they're expressed um, in the down state, the, the trough of the slow oscillation, and fast spindles in the uh, in the peak. But then again, if you take the common average, you now get these somewhat weird-looking um, plots, which are also uh, saying that different halves of the scalp give you a different idea uh, about the phase of the slow oscillation where these spindles peak. So to summarize, the reference choice has a really uh, big impact on metrics of brain dynamics. And especially with the common average reference, I would be aware of artifactual uh, coupling. And again, uh, sadly, there's usually not a single best option. On to how to extract phase and amplitude information. So I only have a single slide here. Um, the main message I want to convey is that for many metrics, absolute phases or amplitudes are not important, only their relative relations. Um, but this makes it easy to get the wrong idea of how you need to extract true phases and amplitudes if you're interested in this. For example, if you want to know the exact phase um, of, of coupling. So to just quickly uh, give you some high level examples without um, telling you how to compute these things, it's very well possible to begin with a simple signal like a sine wave here. And if you use the Hilbert transform to try to get your phases, depending on how you do it, you might get uh, three different uh, time courses of phase angles. Um, and it's important to know uh, which one you're actually uh, building. 
Another example is if you're using wavelets to extract phase or amplitude information. Um, the typical way that a wavelet is presented is, depending on how big your screen is, you may or may not be able to see this, but typically a wavelet is shown like this with its energy containing bit right at the center. If you use that, you're getting um, wrong phase estimates. What you want is you want to have your energy bit containing the bits of your wavelet that contain the highest energy, you want them to be right at the beginning and the end of your signal. Uh, similarly, if you don't uh, rescale your wavelets in the frequency domain, also very technical, um, but if you don't do that, the amplitudes that are returned aren't the amplitudes, um, aren't the absolute amplitudes of, um, of the spectral entities you were looking for. All right, my fourth topic is surrogate testing. So imagine you find some, you're interested in some advanced form of brain dynamics, <clears throat> excuse me, and you measure, um, you use your metric and you get a value of 0.8. Well, that's great, but what does this really uh, mean? Because the problem is that we often don't know what values we can even expect if we, uh, if we only recorded noise, right? If you just um, supply noise to your, um, to your analysis script, it would also uh, come up with the number in the end. So we need to know what the noise level is in order to interpret our, our raw metric. And unfortunately, there's usually not an analytical way of deriving this. Um, the noise level depends not only on your metric, but also on things like the power, the frequency, the individual, things like that. So the way we typically do this is we construct a large set of surrogates where we repeatedly destroy uh, aspects of, of the data according to some null hypothesis. And we recalculate the raw metric many times, say a thousand or, or 10,000 times even. And Here's an example within, uh, within purple here, there's a histogram showing you uh, the values of uh, your metric um, if they're based on this uh, shuffling approach. And in this case, the average is 0.42. And so that would indicate that our, our original value of 0.8 is actually um, unlikely to have been generated uh, by chance or by noise. A uh, small side note here is that how you destroy your data, which we typically uh, do using, uh, which we typically do with a shuffling approach, uh, really matters. So there's good and there's bad shuffling options, and we go into some detail in um, in the paper. So I just mentioned this. We can now compare our observed value to the surrogate or null distribution. Um, and what we can also do is use these surrogates to now z-score our raw metric. And that looks something like this. So now we z-score everything. So now our original surrogates have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And now we can see how uh, far from that normal distribution uh, our observed value truly is in terms of standard deviations. So it's important to realize that this type of surrogate testing, which is often recommended, but you don't need to do it all the time, um, does affect the type of conclusions you might draw. So here I'm showing you phase synchrony, this time calculating, calculated using the weighted phase lag index, doesn't matter, uh, across different frequencies between a frontal and uh, an occipital channel. And so in blue, we have the raw value, and in red, we have uh, the normalized z-scored value. And so the, the raw value here would tell you that we have strongest connectivity uh, around one hertz. That's this peak here. We also see a peak around the, freq uh, around the spindle frequency, but the peak around one hertz is clearly uh, higher. In contrast, the normalized version would tell us that we have strongest connectivity around 15 Hertz. There's still a peak here around one Hertz, but this is now lower than the spindle peak. Uh, 
And so this is unfortunately not uncommon that uh, the relations between different frequencies or different channels or different individuals in terms of raw values are different from the ones when you use normalized values. And this is important to, to, to keep in mind when you're trying to interpret your data. So to summarize this bit, excuse me, um, raw values could just be noise. And um, it's generally a good idea to, um, to, to test this. Um, raw and surrogate normalized metrics can give you different answers. Uh, surrogate construction options also influence your results. And finally, uh, typically, again, there's no single best option. Now, the final um, thing I want to say, uh, the final topic from my paper, at least, is false positives. So in most studies, uh, sleep EEG or otherwise, uh, the null hypothesis is that there's no condition difference or no correlation with behavioral um, metrics or things like that. Now, it's important to remember, or uh, if you didn't hear before, um, that if the null hypothesis is true, so if there is no population effect, you expect a uniform distribution of p-values, like shown on the right here. So this means that if you take random data, um, data that, that does not have an effect, and you use an uncorrected significance threshold of 0.05, on average, one in 20 tests should uh, come up significant. And just to stress, I hope it's obvious that in this case where we know we started with random data, uh, the significant test isn't more likely to be true just because it's significant. That's independent of, um, the significance is, is independent of, um, uh, of whether the effect is true. So whenever we run multiple tests, um, we have this multiple comparisons problem, and there's many ways of correcting for this. I won't go into the details here, um, but I'll say that this type of issue is at least reasonably well appreciated when it comes to multiple outcome variables, different channels, different frequency bands, uh, and things like that. Unfortunately, um, I don't, think that false positives, uh, that concept is often applied to um, the notion of running multiple analysis pipelines. And this is something that is quite common, um, both from my own experience and from what I think I see other people doing, is that it's quite common to change parameters slightly or in, 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 in uh, more, um, let's say, methodical ways where you change where you really step through a whole uh, um, number of parameter settings, uh, all the way to a complete redesign of your pipeline using different metrics and different ways of, of trying to tackle the same problem. But here too, if your null hypothesis is true and there aren't any effects in, your, um, in, in the population, some pipelines will yield significance by chance. And, um, my impression is that this is generally shrugged off a bit as not being a true multiple comparisons issue or that this belongs to signal processing and not so much to statistics. Um, but just to give you a, a toy example of having a very simple, um, in a way, analysis pipeline where there's only seven decisions to be made with three options each, that already gives you over 2000 unique paths and assuming these pipelines would be truly independent, which they're not, but just for the sake of argument, uh, you would expect over a hundred tests to, to show up significant. Um, now, I don't think, or I hope that nobody would actually um, try to run all these different pipelines in this manner. At the same time, you can't rule it out and it's easy enough in principle to set up a script that uh, has seven nested loops and simply flags the, the analysis that shows a significant result. Now, even though I think we should be worried about those false positives, at the same time, there's this, let's say, counteracting force where it's 
very um, informative if we find disagreement between different pipelines, because that can help diagnose errors in one or both of the pipelines. Another thing is that agreement from different pipelines is, is good um, because it tells you that what you found isn't a highly dependent on a very specific, um, specific set of parameter settings. So strategic checking um, can, can be helpful. Um, and just to illustrate, I think that the situation where the hypothetical situation where this green um, pipeline is the only one that yielded uh, significant results um, is uh, fundamentally different from a situation where all these related pipelines would um, uh, give you the same result. So that makes for, um, that gives a little bit of complexity because on the one hand, you don't want to endlessly uh, test pipelines until you get significant. On the other hand, it's, it's helpful to strategically test and make sure that uh, your anal analyses are um, operating the way you want, want them to. So what we can, can we do about this? Um, I think one of the best ways of handling all of this is to develop your complete pipeline or multiple pipelines prior to group analyses. So you build and test extensively with one or several pilot subjects. Um, and this really forces you to be explicit about how you operationalize your hypothesis, how you're exactly going to calculate your metrics. And then of course, uh, the big trick is to, to stick to the plan or don't, but then uh, you know that you're engaging in exploratory analyses. Another uh, way of handling this is to use half of your data for uh, exploration as much as you want, and then half of the data to confirm the, the things you, find, you found while exploring data. Now, if you have lots of data available, this is easy. Um, but for many research designs, which rely on still relatively small samples, this really requires, you know, essentially doubling your sample size, which um, may not be feasible at all times. So to summarize, uh, repeatedly testing your analysis pipelines increases the false positive risk. At the same time, comparing multiple pipelines can help you test uh, the robustness of your analyses. Okay, those were the five topics from my paper. I have a few more things that I wanted to include in, in the same general uh, vein of, of, of these topics. So I'm very much aware of the replication crisis and all these things that we shouldn't be doing like data dredging, p-hacking, uncorrected testing, harking, if you don't know the term is hypothesizing after results are known, publication bias and all that. Um, at the same time, I feel that these bad things are, um, are often equated with exploratory or descriptive work is bad. And I don't necessarily believe that is the case. Um, just to give you an example, uh, I'm not going to explain this, this, this figure in detail. Um, but uh, a year ago or so, we published this um, paper where uh, we were interested in looking at which frequency pairs show coupling during sleep in the hippocampus. That, that was the main question. And what we did is we calculated surrogate normalized cross-frequency coupling for 989 frequency pairs on seven hippocampal channels during three sleep stages. And so that's a total of 20,000 20, tests. Now, it's not like uh, that any statistician has, to has told me uh, you should uh, correct for every individual pixel um, that, you, that you tested here. At the same time, if you're taking um, uh, a strict approach to how we should be doing these things, uh, that might actually be the suggestion. And Regardless of what all of this means, I would think that most people um, would see certain clusters of activity in these plots. And if I were to actually use the strictest form of, um, of multiple comparison correction here, the only conclusion I could draw is that there's nothing going on here. And I feel that that isn't very reasonable and 
Um, so I, I think it's important to keep in not keep in mind whether um, suggestions of how you uh, should do your statistics um, apply to what you're actually trying to do. Um, my almost final topic, um, not so much about signal processing, but I, I think it's important to mention, um, has to do with terminology and for lack of a better term, mapping. So there's often this ambiguous mapping between a metric name and its computation. So uh, on the one hand, you might have different terms like phase locking value, phase coherence, phase synchronization, intersect phase clustering for one and the same mathematical operation, whatever's uh, in, in this equation here. On the other hand, you might have one term like phase synchronization um, and a lot of different mathematical operations apply to that. So here you have intersect phase clustering, phase lag index, coherency, weighted phase lag index. Um, so this, this leads to a lot of confusion I've noticed and, and it's not often clear what people are, are, are talking about when they uh, take a term like phase synchronization. And yeah, just to add, this is just for phase synchronization and for other uh, metrics, um, you have similar problems. Um, somewhat related, but maybe at a slightly higher uh, hierarchical um, level is an unclear or underspecified relation between, on the one hand, your theoretical or semantic or verbal concept, and on the other hand, now your metric and computation. And going back to synchronization, so not phase, synchroni not phase synchronization, but synchronization in general, this is a term that can mean so many things like consistent phase differences, correlated amplitudes, association between different frequency bands, a co-occurrence of events, uh, even consistent phase across trials. And then for each, you have many, many metrics. So, Sometimes you might um, encounter a verbal hypothesis, which seems relatively precise, such as we expect reduced frontal parietal synchronization, but this maps onto a very large number of metrics. And then you add your different channels, your different frequencies. And so now you have a virtually infinite number of findings that would be consistent with your hypothesis. And this of course is, is bad news in terms of the whole uh, false positive um, issue that we want to avoid. Uh, final thing related here is somewhat different, diff somewhat different, but also terms like coherence or information. It's not often clear whether people are referring to the, their everyday semantic meaning, so in a rather loose sense, or are they referring to a highly specific signal processing or information theory theory concept. And I'm just mentioning this because I've noticed that this is also a source of confusion. Um, all right, very last uh, topic here that I have, I just uh, added this at the last moment, but I figured since I'm talking about signal processing in uh, about sleep EEG so much, um, it might be helpful to say something about how you can actually do that. Now, I'm not going to give you specific recommendations of which software to use because A, I never compiled the list and B, I, I haven't used um, that many approaches myself. But just in very general terms, um, the graphical user interface or the point and click, uh, mostly from commercial vendors. Uh, pros of course are that it's intuitive and uh, you have limited options to make errors, not impossible, but it's usually restricted. The downside is, of course, very limited flexibility. Uh, you can only uh, perform the operations for which there's a button. And it's not, impos it's not possible to inspect underlying code. And I'm mentioning that because um, bugs do exist also in this point and click software. It's just that you, wouldn't, you typically wouldn't ever uh, become aware of it. On the other hand, uh, coding uh, gives you just extreme flexibility. Uh, you can do uh, you can do exactly what you want, and then there's this combination of starting from completely custom code 
to using uh, toolboxes. I'm only naming here the ones that I've been using, uh, EEG lab, field trip, sleep trip. Uh, a good thing about toolboxes is that they typically have uh, pretty big communities, so you can uh, share your uh, issues with other people. And then you can uh, supplement these things with random online code for visualization, uh, things like that. The biggest uh, or the other big uh, uh, advantage is just the possibility to troubleshoot and I think especially in research um, situations, you want to be able uh, to do that. Um, downsides are, of course, it is a can be a very steep learning curve and um, there are endless options to make um, errors. And just to give a very uh, small anecdote, we once had a paper in revision already and uh, just based on review or comments, I was checking something and then uh, discovered an error that I made. Some correlation went away and then the paper evaporated. So that isn't uh, exactly good news, um, but it does, uh, it does happen. And of course you learn from that. Um, and somewhat related is that it's not only your own errors, other people's bugs can affect you as well. And fortunately, this hasn't happened to me, but I am aware of um, a paper that had to be retracted because the authors relied on a toolbox. And in that toolbox, some operation turned out was being done row wise instead of column wise, which um, um, at least in MATLAB is just a single quote, um, which is a horrible way to have to retract your paper. But yeah, those, those, those type of things are possible. Um, very general, beware of black box and non-maintained software and code. Um, especially the black box thing, if, if, if you're not exactly sure that what, um, if the functionality that you're hoping to implement is, is operating the way it should, it, it's best to stay away from it. Uh, and similar with non-maintained software, um, if something was written four years ago and hasn't been updated since, it might still work, um, but also be, uh, be careful with it. All right, just some small recommendations. Um, to the issue of um, where you have small analysis choices that can have large effects on your outcome measures, try to strategically evaluate the effects of analysis choices uh, to ensure robustness and consider how many related pipelines were run when you're interpreting your results. Um, on the other hand, or not on the other hand, but another big issue is that your analysis pipeline may not work as intended, uh, even without obvious errors. And I'm underlining that last bit because when there's errors, of course, we're going to uh, try to figure out uh, what the reason for that is. But even if you don't see obvious errors, there might still be uh, some. So what you can do about that is code review is really helpful if you have, uh, if you work with somebody else and, and you can check each other's code and catch each other's mistakes, um, that's always helpful. Um, Inspect intermediate values, especially if uh, you're implementing, implementing processing uh, steps for the first time. What is the range of values you're expecting? Um, you're getting complex numbers in, in return. Is this even what you should have? Uh, somewhat related, uh, visualize intermediate results. Do the signals prog progress across time the way you expect them to? Use toy examples, just small bits of data, maybe just 20 seconds from a single channel. Um, and also simulations. Um, it's, it might take some time to, uh, to learn how to build your own sine wave or compound sine wave. But once you have that, it's so much easier to check whether your analysis um, pipeline does what it's supposed to do, because now you have a ground truth. You know exactly what you put into your, um, in, into your artificial signal, and you just wanna see if you can get that out on the, at the other end. And I already mentioned this, extensively develop and test your pipeline prior to group analyses. All right, 
final thoughts, um, signal processing is extremely powerful. It, it really is. At the same time, it's very easy to make errors um, or delude yourself into thinking that you found something that you didn't. Uh, this should have been switched around. There we go. Um, some approaches are wrong. Many are reasonable. No single one is best. And that goes a little bit into the next point, which is that there's many guidelines for individual methods, but how you should put it all together or statistically evaluate uh, your, your complex um, analysis pipeline is there's usually not um, uh, a cookbook recipe to do that. So it's up to the researcher to balance countless and, and oftentimes conflicting issues. And one of the concluding sentences from our paper, which is also my concluding sentence here, is that relating sleep EEG to cognition and disease is important, but it is also difficult. And I stand by that uh, to this day. All right, um, unlike a regular talk about uh, a single study, uh, I can really um, thank you know, the, the collaborators of a particular study. It's really everyone I've ever had a methodological exchange with over my uh, years working in different labs. So I'm just listing the senior people in the labs I've worked uh, at and everyone who's ever had uh, an exchange with me about data is, uh, is uh, I'm, I'm grateful to. And that is what I had to say. Thank you for listening. <laughs>